Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whenever, or maybe good night, I guess, depending upon when you guys are watching this. This is section 1.3, Introduction to Experimental Design. So we're going to talk about different experimental ways to set up a study or something that we can do, perhaps your final project at the end of the year. Actually, I should talk about objectives to discuss a census, which all of you hopefully know what, kind of what that means. Describe simulations. Uh, uh, observational studies and experiments, identify control groups, so you need to know what a control group is, and then discuss potential pitfalls or problems that you end up getting. Okay, Guidelines for planning a study, this is basically the process you will go through. You must identify your individual or objects of interest. Who are you going to look at? Specify the variables. What are you going to look at? Determine if you're going to use the entire population. Is this even possible? Or if you're going to have to figure out what kind of sampling method Okay. Determine a plan. Okay. Privacy, ethics, all those stuff must come into plan. And I'll kind of talk about my study I did to get my master's. And a lot of you were involved with that actually uh, two years ago. Collect data. Analyze the data. And then note any concerns or basically write up your findings. That's kind of the process. So before we get into that, we need to talk about a few uh, vocabulary things. Census versus a sample. Okay. Hopefully everybody has heard a census before. The United States does a census every how many years? Ten, hopefully everybody said. Okay. Um, and it measures basically the entire population. Why is this uncommon? Because it's very, very difficult. Because people move and things like that. So this is very rare, but it's nice to talk about. Okay, It's useful when a, a population you're kind of figuring out is small. It is useful, but... Um, it's, not, it's just not very easily. So a sample, which we've already kind of talked about that, it's just part of the population. Okay, It's very common. That's what we're going to use in this class more than anything. And then last time, last section, we talked about these five different ways that you can sample, whether it's simple random, simple random, stratified cluster, systematic, or convenience. And like I said, our book will definitely be using the, the simple random samples more so than any of the others that you see. Okay? Observation versus experiment. Once again, these are logical ideas. If you observe something, what are you going to do? You're going to measure something. Okay? And observed are obtained in a way that does not change the response or variable being measured. Okay? A lot of you, if you're being watched and you know you're being watched, does your behavior change? Possibly. Oh, I'm pushing buttons and I shouldn't. So you guys can laugh at that online. Okay? So if you know that somebody's watching you, does your behavior change? Probably. If the teacher's around in the hallway, is your behavior a little bit different than if you're completely by yourself outside with no adult around? Maybe, for instance, the, the vocabulary and the words you choose to say? Probably. Okay. So observational means that you are observing things, writing things down, and not, and the, and the person you're looking at has no clue. Okay. An experiment. Okay. A treatment or something that you're doing is applied to individuals in the experiment in order to observe a possible change, and, and you kind of take down the response of the variable. So an experiment would be if you actually try to do something to see if it's effective or not. Okay? Designed experiments are used to pin down the cause and effect. I'm going to do this to see if something else happens, and that's kind of the goal between the experiment to observed. Okay? Designed experiments. Now I'm going to go through a couple of these different designed experiments. Uh, a few things should you should note. Okay, so designed experiments to measure the effect of a treatment. So in order to kind of to do this, and I kind of and I'll explain this more with my thing that I did in grad school. But you need a treatment group and a control group. Okay, a treatment group are the members that are going to have the quote unquote treatment actually done to them, and you measure if the variable worked. Okay, a control group. Okay, members receive a placebo or dummy treatment or many times just nothing happens at all and you still kind of observe what the person does. Now with the placebo effect, this can be a little bit skewed. The measurable change in the variable due to recipients thinking they actually did receive something when they actually did not. So for instance, some, and usually this happens more in the medical field, these treatments and where this, you see this, maybe a patient actually feels better after taking a sugar pill instead of taking a drug of some sort that's supposed to help you out. Maybe, and it can be any type of, of a pill that a healthcare system wants to try to show you. They might establish you know, 40 people to be in the treatment group and they give that pill to see how they do. 
the control group might get a sugar pill. And everybody swallows the pill and they don't know which group they're in. And the ones that are in the control group, ooh, I took the pill and I feel better. That is what we call the placebo effect. You might trick your brain into feeling better than you actually are. So that's why the health system maybe does this. Okay. Now there are more extreme cases. To reduce variables that might influence patient's response to treatment, we sometimes use, to kind of get rid of that placebo effect, a randomized two-treatment experiment. All this is is you're randomly assigned to one of the two groups. Okay, One group receives the treatment under the study. The control, the control group receives the placebo, but they have no idea which one they're in. Okay, So that's a little bit different than the other one. This one, they have no clue. The original one... They, everybody knew kind of which one they were in. Okay, The results are compared. The randomization, or i.e. the people not knowing which group they're in, okay, prevents a lot of bias, or prevents the placebo effect essentially. And the replication on many subjects will assure that changes are not caused by random chance. So many times, um, one study is not enough. You want to do multiple studies before you claim some type of response or findings that you have made in a statistical study. All right. To help ensure val validity of any experiment, you need a control group. And I've talked about this already. Limits known or unknown variables that might influence the outcome of an experiment. You need to know and, and see what is caused by something. Okay, the control group's essential. All right. Lurking variable. Um, it's an unknown variable that might be an underlying cause for the change in measurement and many times, and we'll kind of talk about this, but but many times you can't predict a lurking variable sometimes and it, it just, it, it's going to happen. Whether it might be the economy, it might be something else, money driven, there's many different things that can be a lurking variable and our homework will actually kind of talk about this quite a bit more. All right, randomization. Placing individuals in the control treatment group randomly is required to prevent bias in the measurement. You, you should do this. It, it always should be randomized. You don't want to put um, like people in one place and, and other people in another. To uh, You almost skew your results. You want it to be completely random and just kind of see what happens is kind of the goal. And then replication. You should replicate things. Repeat experiments. Okay, Reduces the possibility that something weird can skew your results. So, control groups, lurking variables can have a uh, can happen, but randomization and replication are, are really important to ensure that something is valid. Okay, in order to essentially publish it in any magazine or newspaper or wherever you want to publish it at. Okay, so experiment designs used to limit the influence of lurking or you know, how do we limit these things? Blind experiments, which I've discussed that. Participants in the study do not know which treatment they are receiving. Many times this is very important. Okay, Talked about the double blind experiment a little bit. Both the participants and those administering the treatment do not know which treatment is being applied. So this is even more important that if the participants and those administering the treatment don't know which one is applied, that's really good. Um, I know Major League Baseball you know, with the steroid issue, some of you sports fans, this would be something that would be very, very important to do so that nobody knows what's going on or what's being tested and then administrating the treatment especially is important if you're taking samples and you don't know which one's which because you don't want to mess up treatments and things like that. So something like this is major, major, major important for a big money-making industry like Major League Baseball. Okay, Another one, Randomized two treatment experiment. It's just assigning members to a treatment and control groups by using a random process. Just think of the randomized. It's like your random number table. Yeah, the first one's going here, and then if it's odds there or whatever, you might just assign randomly to whether they're in a treatment or control group. This is good so you're not bringing into bias for something you want to have happen. And then blocking. Okay, this is a different type of one which might be important. Um, Splitting individuals into similar groups before applying different treatments. So, it, for instance, and this is, I think, logical for an example like this. Before applying one of two exercise programs, block individuals into weight categories. Because if you think of, I don't know how many of you I've done Insanity and P90X and things like that, you know, different weight people are going to effectively, you know, 
skew results. It's going to be different for different people on how much weight loss you do or things like that because some people do it to lose weight. Some people do it to gain muscle and actually gain weight. It's a little bit different. So it's kind of where you start and where you end. You might want to split people into different groups actually and then look at the results. So there's a lot of different ways you can do this and still be random about it and, and, and write your you know results down accordingly. Okay, so these three, which technique would be appropriate for this data? Okay, if you study the effect of calcium supplement given to young girls and bone mass. Okay, can you actually do that? Is that an experiment type problem? I think so, because you're going to have to actually experiment because you need to, it's a cause and effect thing. You need a calcium supplement and see what happens with it. So this would be an experiment situation. Study of the effect of stopping the cooling process on a nuclear reactor. Okay, For instance, in Japan, when they had the tsunami and the nuclear reactors were going up, did anybody want to go touch them? Probably not. Do you want to repeat that? Probably not, because Chernobyl was bad. Nuclear is horrible. So this would be like a simulation. You might want to simulate this. You're not going to put a human in harm's way of a nuclear reactor and figure out how to cool it down. Okay. And then the study of the amount of time college students take a full load, spend watching television. This is something you can do by sampling. You're not going to want to do a census on this because you're not going to get every college student. But this would be a situation where sampling would be very good because you can just pick and choose your people however you randomly want to do that. Okay. The last three slides simply talk about surveys, and sooner or later we are going to do a survey for our first little project in this class. So kind of think about how you want to set up a survey and set up questions. Okay, the art of collecting data from respondents through interviews, phone conversation, and polls, and you know basically that's what a survey survey is. You're asking questions, getting data. Are the questions asked in a neutral way? You don't want to lead somebody into answering wrong or one particular way. Is the interviewer giving subtle feedback? As an interviewer, are you trying to portray or push the individual you're interviewing into saying something? Um, politics are going on. Do you want them to rip on a Republican or a Democrat? Different things like that. They can have subtle feedback with the person asking the question. Are the respondents answering truthfully? Sometimes you have no idea if that's truth or not. That's why surveying is sometimes difficult. And is the sample a good representation of the population? So that goes back to your sampling. Is What is the best way to go about asking the individual's questions? You need to find a good sample. Okay. Problems with surveying, non-response. If they cannot be contacted or refuse to answer, that's going to be a problem because it's going to turn into more of a volunteer basis. And we already talked about that. That's not completely random. Uh, voluntary response surveys just like I said before, can produce biased results due to strong opinions held by those that actually answered. And then survey results usually cannot pin down a cause and effect relationship simply because there is bias with collecting. There might be other lurking variables and there's no guaranteed results, but that's why there's always the, you have to throw a certain phrase in there and we'll get to that. Um, but but it, at least you can you know see if something has happened or, or look for things. Okay, so what I want you to do is comment on the usefulness of this data. Is there something wrong with how these two scenarios were asked? A uniform officer interviews 20 college freshmen. She asks each one his or her name and if they have used illegal drugs in the last month. You think that's going to get good results? Nope, probably not. Because how many of you or anybody else, even if you have used illegal drugs, are going to tell a uniform officer that you have if you're in college? Yeah. That'd be the dumbest thing you could ever do, actually. Okay, A survey about food in the student cafeteria was conducted by having forms available at the register. A drop box for completed forms is available outside the cafeteria. How many of you in the mad mess of lunch are going to go down there, type your number in, pick up a survey, fill it out while you're eating, and then on your way up to class fifth hour, you're going to actually throw it in a box in a different spot? I'm going to bet very, very few. To do a survey, to do things, you must make it convenient for the person filling it out. Bring it to him or her, pick it up from him or her. Okay, that's the essential idea. So those are two kind of ideas. You're going to need to know kind of things that do not work. And on your assignment for tomorrow in class, we'll talk about 
page 29, 1 through 6. You guys have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow.